Welcome back everybody to me, still reading Wheel of Time. <laughs> and yes, it's Monday, so it's time to start A Crown of Swords, book seven of this mess. And we'll see what I think of it uh, compared to Lord of Chaos, which I think is probably the worst one so far. We'll see if Bobby J is able to recover some, or we'll plunge deeper into ultra-conservative wankery and shitty world-building. Both are distinct possibilities at this point. We'll see where things are going. So yeah, let's get this started and talk about the prologue and the first six chapters. So all the way up to chapter, and including chapter six, which is old fears and new fears. Years, <laughs> which I guess is sort of what I feel right now when I start a new Wheel of Time book. Let's see where this is going, shall we? Well, cheers. <laughs> All right, so um, what can we say? So far, we've only spent time with Perrin and Rand, um, and whatever is going on, I mean, apart from the prologue, which sort of does the usual let's check in with everyone else kind of thing down there. Um, but yeah, um, apart from that, we've only seen Rand and Perrin and what went on at the end of Lord of Chaos, so we're still sort of short any idea what's going down with Elaine, Nynaeve, Egwene, or uh, Matt, um, which I guess we'll find out sooner or later, maybe? We will see. Um, six chapters in, that's not the case. Um, <laughs> so, what can I say? We basically have one of those, like, long, sort of boring prologues which go about the usual stuff, which is like, let's check in with the White Tower, let's check in with the White Cloaks, um, you know, those, those suppo supposed, like, um, uh, opponents of <laughs> Rands that are absolutely incapable of getting anything done because they're all fucking idiots. Turns out that's still the case. <laughs> um, yeah. So, we start out with, um, Elida being Elida, and I, I, <sighs> yeah. So here's the thing, there's nothing much new, it's just the same thing even more, and it still doesn't make any sense. So we first meet Elida, right? We first meet her all the way back in book one as um, counselor to uh, Morghese, Queen Morghese. And she seems to be fairly smart and whatnot. Now she has, you know, the White Tower, she has become extremely dumb, like stupid dumb. Uh, willfully ignoring stuff. I'm not quite sure whether that is, like, intentional or Robert Jordan just really doesn't know how to do these kind of things, but the way she's acting right now, you know, building herself a palace, um, willfully ignoring all kinds of news as wrong or um, unlikely or whatnot, it just does, like, for someone who's supposed to be a valuable advisor to queens and schooled in the White Tower, which is supposed to be, like, the most, um, like, you know, powerful organization in the land with, like, knowledge of everything and whatnot. She is, she's acting unrealistically ignorant in a lot of ways, and I just don't get it. I just literally don't get why, like, no. And I'm, it, it wouldn't be that hard to make her slightly more believable as a character, but it doesn't work. No, she just, like, ignores everything, bullies people around and whatnot, without, like, any sense behind it. It's like, wh why? <laughs> if, she, if she acted like that before, how could she ever work as, like, advisor for Queen Morghese? I, I don't see that happening. I don't see that, like, you know, um, working. But apparently it worked forever, and now it doesn't. And, well, not much going down there apart from, you know, her ignoring everything, believing that Elaine is not in Ebudar, um, believing that, you know, the... the Egwene is just, you know, they have, like, no chance. She's not taking any of the threats to her power seriously, is sort of what I see here. And, you, you know, once again, this sort of 
kind of fits that pattern of, you know, the usurper um, that starts out uh, for um, supposedly right or good reasons, usurps the power, and then um, appears to be woefully underprepared and underqualified to actually rule. As I said, we've seen we've seen that before in other like stories, fantasy stories. Not only, not only even fantasy, but you know, it's been something that we've seen before. So there we are with that, and I, I understand what Robert Jordan is trying to do there. I just think he's not doing a good job because his Elida is so over the top, unprepared, and stupid. It just doesn't it doesn't work out in any meaningful way for me. But, of course, um, we um, see, um, get another one of those prophecies, because, you know, sometimes from time to time we get a prophecy, which is, like, very cheap shorthand for um, foreshadowing, because we just, like, tell what will happen. The prophecies, don't get me wrong, I, I don't mind prophecies in general, but... Yeah, we will see. Um, now, what's going on there is that Elida prophesies, foretells, that the White Tower will be reunited and the Dragon uh, Reborn will face the wrath of the Amerlin. I guess we can assume that that will be um, Egwene. Um, but, you know, and that the Black Tower will be rent asunder and there will be sisters walking through the fires and whatnot of the Black Tower. So... What can we tell from this? At some point, the White Tower will be reunited, and I will just claim that this will be under Egwene and not under Elida. Point two, there will be treachery within the Black Tower, and I assume this will be from Muslim time, because, you know, we always know that uh, <laughs> the ones we subject, uh, suspect first, the most obvious choice will be the person actually doing the dumb thing. That's just like how this works in Wheel of Time. Evil people can be discovered by their sheer evilness, and um, we know that from the start. Everyone, like, there's, like, no, like, shading of good or evil. There's, like, someone who appears shady and shifty will definitely be evil. And, um, yeah. So we'll see where that is, like, how that is going um, in the future. Whether these are prophecies for the end of this book or prophecies for a later book. We'll find out, I assume. Um, but, yeah. We obviously also have, like, some conversation with Alviaren, who we get, like, more confirmation that she actually is, obviously, Black Aja. Um, and she talks to Misana. Misana, yeah. After, you know, her report on whatnot. So we know that Elida is just playing at Amarlin because she doesn't know, and Alviaren is changing and, you know, sabotaging everything Elida does. Yeah. Well, what do I think of that? Um, like, um, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't like the idea that much. Um, the way Alviaren is Black Aja and is sort of like, you know, the one basically the Eminence Grease or the power behind the throne in a lot of ways. In general, I don't mind that. Like, it's once again, it's a trope. You have that. It's... Oftentimes, when you have like more, you know, the um, the Orientalist cliche, it's usually the Grand Vizier, the, the feared Grand Vizier. <laughs> that Terry Pratchett actually makes like really interesting points and jokes about in um, sorcery. <laughs> but yeah, the idea of the cliche is usually like the Grand Vizier, or you know, in Lord of the Rings, it's a Grima Wormtongue, that kind of person. And I don't mind that. You know, it's a trope, and tropes, I don't mind in general. They, they can be executed well. I'm not sure if I agree that Alviaren is a good way of doing that. I mean, on the one hand, we kind of know that like, basically everyone except Elida and Egwene are probably Black Aja at this point. Who knows? Um, yeah. But... Um, it feels more with this kind of thing... It feels more like um, like conspiracy theories of like like you know the deep state kind of thing because 
the idea of a grand vizier is like everyone knows that that person is in power despite, you know, whatever like the official hierarchy may, may say. But this is not the case in, in the White Tower, at least as far as we know, which is not that much because, you know, we don't get like actually many meaningful scenes anywhere in these books. So we don't know if like everyone else, when they want to do something, just go to, um, to Alviarn because everyone basically knows Alviarn is in power. Now, we don't know that because we don't get any scenes from, like, the White Tower except these where Elida is just doing dumb shit. Um, so, possibly? But I don't want to be the person who has to make excuses for Bobby J. That's not my fucking job. So, what we instead get is someone who is basically bureaucracy, but is changing and doing these dark things with bureaucracy... Um, despite, you know, what the people in charge actually want, which, you know, sets up that idea of the deep state in a way that, you know, people um, from certain um, conspiracies um, really like to talk about. And I don't want to, you know, go full on QAnon here because that's not, obviously not historically accurate, but it it is obviously an idea that we see in certain parts of politic, uh, politics that people mistrust the bureaucracy of a state. <laughs> they assume that that bureaucracy has, you know, built their own ideas, interests, and whatnot, and, um, yeah, the way this is handled here with Alviarn kind of goes in that direction. Once again, I'm not accusing Robert Jordan of anything political here. <laughs> I'm saying uh, the, the way he sets up these things, the, the things he focuses on as a writer, express certain uh, certain aspects of common beliefs in a way political beliefs of possibly the author because they feel to be not actually deliberate they're more like subconscious in a way it's like i, I believe it's possible that this is how authority works now, probably not but there we are um we then obviously have a bit of a meeting with Alviar and, and Messana, and Messana teaches Alviar on how to do portals, so I guess at some point gateways will become available to um, the White Tower, Tower Aes Sedai, or at least the Black Aja. Apparently they weren't before. So yeah, that's something that we've, um, uh, that we get out of there as actual information, and apart from that, it's, you know, the usual having people grovel, having women humiliated and grovel before a, a pow more powerful women, I guess. <laughs> Which, nothing new, but there we are. It, I've, I've read much worse in these books so far than this part of the prologue. It's nothing new, it, 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 is oversimplified and um, crude in a lot of ways and annoying in that regard, but you know, that's that's not egregious, it's just bad. And at this point, I kind of settle for just bad and not actually egregious. So that's that part, and then we check in with, um, what are they called? Um, the White Cloaks and the Children of the Fucking Light. All right. Um, um, basically, we see Pedro and Niall being assassinated because now there's obviously like a coup within the the Children of the Light as well, and Eamon Walder taking over, and all this other crap. It's nothing interesting. The White Cloaks make less and less sense from like book to book, and here's like one first thing that I find annoying is like. So there is, like, the more inquisitorial aspect of it, um, the, 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 the Hand of Light. Everyone calls them questioners. No one likes them at all. It's like, if you have this huge military organization and the military arm, the ones that actually do the fighting, despise the questioners, why are they still a part of this organization? Everyone, even, you know, Pedro and Nile and that gang, Eamon Walder, all the military commanders are like, you know what? Those people suck. They just torture people for the love of torturing, and it doesn't really matter. We can just go and kill people no matter what. We don't like those people at all. They're treacherous. They're all psychopaths. They're sadists. We don't like them. We just, you know, want to walk, march outside in our jackboots and brown shirt, uh, white cloaks and um, <laughs> bully people. But we're honest in that way, right? And they... So why is that still a part? They could just, like, go and arrest all of those questioners, <laughs> string them up for something or other, or just, like, you know kick the shit out of them, that's that, like, that organization, 
as a whole does not make any fucking sense. Now, there are probably ways you can fix that. You can go and like explain why the White Cloaks are who they are, their philosophy, where they're going with all of that, why they have the rights they have. Um, but Robert Jordan doesn't do that. We're seven books in. This is like book seven of 14 books. I'm halfway through this story. And those are people, an organization that shows up from the first book onwards, every single fucking book, at least once. We don't get any of those explanations. Yes, there is apparently a book by the founder of the White Cloaks about his philosophy. Gallard shows it to men in, I guess, Shadow Rising? I think? Or maybe near the end of The Dragon Reborn, but I think it's at the beginning of The, uh, of the Shadow Rising. Must be, I assume. My memory is getting kind of wonky at this point. I assume it's at the beginning of The Shadow Rising, or middle of Shadow Rising, one of the main chapters. Anyway, so he shows that book to her, and that's, that's all we learn about it. Do we know what the philosophy of the White Cloaks is? No, we don't. Do we know why they got founded and got all those privileges that they have in Amardesia? No, we don't. Why did anyone ever allow a gang of, like, thugs, self-righteous th thugs, to become this powerful? Where's the fucking basis for it? And it just never gets explained. So anyway, they're obviously also very much corrupt and not actually true believers, apart from possibly um, Gallard, who is still out there doing Gallard things. So I assume sooner or later he'll make his way up to uh, this organization, because if there's one trend that we see is that, like, over time more or less good or powerful or semi-trustworthy, Gallard is trustworthy, people that we meet in book one will take over all important roles of power in this world, so at the end of the whole thing, Rand can send all of them against the Dark One. So that's that's my claim. So I guess Gallard will take over the, the White Cloaks. It would just make sense from the way these books are structured. But for now, it's Eamon Walder who used to command outside of um, Tarvalon and sort of personally recruited uh, Gallard, I think, sort of. But yeah, you know, that's that's basically what happens because Eamon Walder kills Peter and Nile um, sort of through a setup where he sends, like, the weird spy, ma spy master, the pseudo spy master to kill Peter and Nile, Nile then kills him. Um, <clears throat> obviously... We have another one of those really important things, like the, the, the cheap shots that Bobby J is always using. Eamon Walder got like a very important trust, important secret message about, I assume, another Shan Chan um, invasion in Tanchico, I guess. Um, yeah, he got that. And it's now blurred because of wine or blood, so no one reads it because, you know, Pedro and Nile died before he could tell anyone. So there we go. Um, important information gets, um, you know, not sent along to the White Cloaks, so they can't do anything about it. No one else knows. Um, I guess we'll hear of this later on. Once again, like, misunderstanding or lack of information is one of the things that Robert Jordan uses to death as a plot device in these books. So yeah, there we go with that. Um, Pedro and Nile dead. Eamon Walder takes over. He still wants to use more gays to take over what's a place called um, Andor. I assume at this point there will be war in Andor because we need to actually drag this whole thing out. We still have seven books, eight books to fill. I assume it won't be as easy as we think, which is like take Elaine, get them to Andor, make her queen of Andor and Kyrian. No, we need to come up with unrealistic reasons of why that will not happen. Um, here we are, we have another one of those. Anyway, um, what else did we learn from this? Not much, really. The, the torturers want to torture more gays. I assume by torture we still mean spanking, because anything else is always hinted at and never actually done. We will see. And then we have a final bit in the in the prologue, which is all about Gawain. Gawain. Still know how, I don't know how to pronounce the guy, but you know, the guy who's looking for a green knife, which is of course why he has like green colors and stuff. Anyway, so Gawain uh, left uh, the battle around um, what's it called um, uh, for Rand's freedom and whatnot, and yeah. 
he still hates Rand, he still believes Rand killed Morghais, he doesn't believe Egwene in that, but he follows Egwene's orders because he's absolutely in love and that means she will never break any oath to her. I don't know. But yeah, so he's gone with the younglings, we'll see, he'll probably cause trouble somewhere at some point. Um, or just meet up with Egwene and gang when they go back to the White Tower. We will find out in the future. Oh, and a final bit, um, Savannah and the um, Shido. <sighs> what can I say? It still doesn't make any sense. We have like this whole idea, like, and I'm not sure if this is like an actual, you know, inconsistency or whatever, but Bobby J, like, right? talked about last time that Savannah is using, is throwing away that magic stone cube or whatever that will help her um, do something to Rand and decides not to use it. Now this time around we see the, the attack of the Shido on the Aes Sedai and Rand and everyone from her perspective. Don't worry, her perspective is just as shallow as you thought it would be because She's a woman, and she's evil, and we know that, so obviously she's ignorant, arrogant, and has no, like, further depth of character in there at all. Um, so yeah. Um, but she still has that cube, and she's lucky, she's happy that she didn't throw it away, so she can still use it, pull it out as a threat for Rand, which I feel is cheap, because, yeah, whatever. We'll just keep it there in case we need it for, like, later stuff to drag out the story more, I guess. Apart from that, um, yeah, as I said, like, her character is shallow as fuck. It, it, you know, you could build a whole thing about, like, how she, as someone with no magical training, didn't become a wise one, um, wanted to become a wise one, um, how she doesn't get, like, to be clan chief because she has to, because of the rules. You could build a whole thing about, like, how tradition is weighing her down and how that... You could, but no, she just wants power and she wants to show her boobs. Except one of the wise ones has shown even more boobs, which, I don't know. And then he plays that same trick that he plays with Elida, and that's so annoying in the in this, like, first, um... In this... Uh, prologue, right? We have those three main, like, opponents there. We have Savannah and the Shido, we have Elida and the White Tower, and we have Pedro and Nile and the White Cloaks. And all three of them are willfully ignorant and stupid. And, like, no one gets anything done of those opponents of Rand's because they just willfully ignore information or unwilling to actually check out a situation or whatever. And it doesn't make any sense because all, of, all three of them are supposed to be People are, you know, they they are in positions of power. They probably got them because they're actually good at what they do, and that doesn't show in their behavior. Whether whether we're talking Pedro or Nile, who's sort of like thoughts we get, not so much Iman uh, Iman Walder. We'll we'll hear about him, I guess, in the future, um, or Elida or Savannah. They're just like like kids, and I'm like, why, why the fuck? It doesn't make any sense. And it's sort of like an insult to the reader. Anyway, we get like that that battle again that we saw at the end of the whole thing from, uh, what's it, from uh, Lord of Chaos. We got it from Perrin's perspective and partly from Rand's perspective. And this time around we see it from Savannah's perspective. It doesn't change much. She's now fleeing with the rest of the Shido and we'll see what comes of that. But frankly, I don't care that much. All right, let's talk about the actual chapters. Not much happens there either. It just takes a long time. I feel the play, the pace has slowed down even further. So basically, we have everyone sitting around. We get a long thing about Rand, you know, being sad because more women died. Um, then they, you know, transport themselves over back to Kyrian, where Colaver has crowned herself Queen of Kyrian. And Rand... Um, undoes that again and that's basically all of it plus you know weird ideas on relationships but we're kind of used to that at this point right anyway so what can we take out of this <sighs> we still keep to the whole like killing women is wrong kind of thing and i'm once again like 
I'm mildly annoyed by it. And don't get me wrong, killing women is wrong. Killing men is wrong. Killing in general is wrong. But to have these people go and commit mass murder, and that's basically what they did last time around with, what's his name? Um, uh, Mazrim Time and the Ashaman, they go and like just actually kill thousands of people. And Rand is doing the same. They're using magic. They're killing people, a lot of them. And afterwards, they're like, you know what? Killing sucks, but oh my God, we killed a bunch of women as well. That's terrible. It hurts my soul so deeply. And it, it is never questioned that this might just be like, you know, a weird in any ways. No, no, no. This is exactly like basically killing women, striking women, unless they ask for it, I assume, <laughs> is like completely morally wrong and he's on a completely different level of moral wrongness compared to um, killing men. Which, no, at the end of the day, it's not. And I don't really understand why Robert Jordan makes such a big thing and such a big deal about this whole, like, don't kill women kind of thing in comparison to don't kill people because killing people sucks. Uh, but it's, I guess, one of the things that are just like this whole like old old white male, old white male kind of thing. This like gentleman things. Like you open the door for an Aes Sedai and you don't kill her, and you also pull her chair out because she's a woman. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know, dude. It it just feels odd that he just puts it out there so much and puts such a big emphasis on it. I don't know. No, nothing new, but it, it's kind of annoying and not really. Nah. It shows more, it shares more about Robert Jordan than anything else, I would say. Apart from that, you know, we get more conflict with the Aes Sedai, which also still doesn't really make any sense because Aes Sedai are also behaving like idiots, apparently, and they just continue to behave as idiots. And all these interactions in these like chapters, like all of that stuff is so willfully, stubbornly wrong. And I'm like, why, why can people that are supposed to be smart and in control and whatnot, why can't people, any of those people are able to behave like human beings? They're all just like shallow character, like, like caricatures that are pushed around and behave like fucking idiots all the time. Anyway, there's a bunch of conflict brewing. We get this rubbed in, um, um, very deeply, because all of this goes through Perrin's nose, I guess. Plus, Perrin is only thinking about, like, his weird um, jealousy conflict with Fael. Which gets resolved by him yelling at her, because that's apparently how you do that. <laughs> anyway, they go back, they find out that there's all this, like, trouble in those, like, almost two weeks that Rand wasn't there. Suddenly, everything goes to hell. And I'm like... Well, he was away before, and no one cared that much about it, but apparently now it's a big deal. Um, not that interesting at the end of the day. They march into Kyrian and do the Cola Bear thing. Now, there's one, there's two things here that are interesting. First of all, um, he just deposes Cola Bear again and um, confiscates her, like, stuff. Um, her possessions, takes away her title and everything, and banishes her to work on a farm. But we remember that Min had a vision, right? Min had a, had a seeing of her that said Colibur got hanged. Which apparently would be the official punishment for what she did. Now the important question there is, will Min's uh, seeing still become true? And Colavera get herself in more trouble, so she gets hanged, or not. We don't know, um, but that's sort of like most of the stuff that is going around here that I think is interesting with that, and I don't want to, you know, stretch this too long today. Um, the other bit is obviously um, the whole Fael parent thing. It, it over-dominates, like, the, once again, we're talking about the end of the world, but all these people think about is getting married, um, uh, Loyal is thinking more and more about this, like, woman from, what, Dragon Reborn? No, Great Hunt, I assume. It was Great Hunt, I think, when they went to Steading Tofu. Um, <clears throat> 
um, I don't know, and he's like talking all about like how he has to marry her as soon as possible, and maybe because of what his name, <clears throat> Rand being doing the dumb uh, marry me Taveran thing for whatever reason. But it may just be Robbie J being like very much about like getting more people married. It really has to happen in these books. <clears throat> However, as I said, like there's like big things that are annoying with um, the whole parent fail thing. Fail is still jealous towards um, Berylaine, who is somewhere. Um, all right, she she fled to the sea folk on their boat, which Rand still has to meet and has avoided a lot. I hope he does soon. So we get some more, you know, actual action or something going on. But until then, I wanted to talk a bit about the uh, Perrin Fael thing. Because what it boils down to is that Fael is still jealous of, um, not really jealous of Perrin. She just like <clears throat> tries to get a rise out of him. Sort of by pretending to be jealous, I assume. And all of that gets solved when he just physically handles her rough and tells her that he loves her, like, forcefully, in, like, very much a brutal way. And she's like, you know, sometimes a woman wants to get told that she's loved in that specific way. And that kind of comes back to that whole um, her mother talks that her mother gives to um, uh, to Perrin about how strong women want to be dominated physically. And I'm, he... Like, Bobby Jane just goes ahead and does it here again. It's like, they pretend to be strong women, but really what they want is to be, like, dominated even more by a stronger male. And it just, it just is so fucking frustrating to see that as, like, basically a role model for a working marriage. Like, if that is your personal thing, then, yeah, good on you. Be, be that way. That's fine. But that's... I don't know, it, it just rubs me the wrong way that that's sort of like the only way apparently anything works here is like by domination and you, pro you provoke the other person to dominate you and that's apparently all like any form of like no or whatever is read at and that's, you know, once again goes into the whole like um, question of consent, like if she says no, what you do is you do it harder until she says yes, and, like, that's that's toxic as fuck is what it is. All right, one final thing that I wanted to mention, because it really, I think, kind of shows... It's a, it's a super minor thing, right? It's not important at all, but I felt it has to be mentioned, because there is um, something interesting that it shows, I think. Actually, there's two things, but yeah. let's talk about the really annoying bit. So Rand has some interaction with one of the Aes Sedai and tells, their, tells that Aes Sedai off or whatever. And Bobby J writes, she draws herself up regally. And a regal Aes Sedai can make a queen look like, and I quote, a slattern. And the problem with that is... So, re regality? Is that like the word? I think. <laughs> regal demeanor is the one side of the coin, and the opposite of that is not, you know, I don't know, not standing up straight like our Lord and Savior um, Jordan Peterson wants us to stand up, but, like, apparently it is slattern, which is, you know, <laughs> fucking demeaning, um, and goes once again into the whole, like, slut-shaming kind of thing, you know, like, how, ca how can you think that, like, those are, like, opposites, Regal bearing and slattern bearing. It's like, how, 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 how can that enter your fucking mind? As and, and that's why I wanted to bring it up. You know, as I said, it's, it's absolutely a minor thing. It doesn't impinge in any fucking way on the story or anything else. It just shows Robert Jordan's mindset that when he says, like, when he wants to talk about, um, you know, uh, yeah, when he wants to talk about, like, regal bearing, and he wants to make a comparison of like, how arrogantly, um, I guess, um, Aes Sedai can, you know, behave. When I get that, uh, and there's, like, all kinds of ways to do that without slut-shaming in the background. Uh, but he, he, cho he chooses that one. He chose that one, and I think that's... As I said, this is one of those small bits that just, like, pop up from time to time that just, like, show you the absolutely fucked up, mis uh, misogynist way a lot of these things work in Wheel of Time. 
So yeah, that's that's what I want to uh, bring up here, right? It's like, no, don't don't do that, because it shows you really don't respect women that actually want to do whatever the fuck they want to do. No, you can't. It's purity and regal behavior, or you're a slattern. So yeah, fuck that. The other bit is obviously that the way, and I think that's absolutely horrifying. The other thing that we see here with like Alana and Rand going down, right? So Alana bonded Rand against his will, which as Bobby J acknowledges is basically rape. I mean, it's you know not sexual, but it, it is the same thing at the end of the day in like this worldview. But she fails and everyone like only condemns her for her failure. And she's like treated like shit by everyone, but not because she did something that is morally wrong, but only because she failed. And he pushes that again and again. And the way he he flips that whole thing for like Rand gets to basically overcome that attack of Alana's by dominating the fuck out of her, <laughs> making her suffer and all of that. And you know, I can I can see that as, you know, like um, as as a form of self empowerment or whatever you want to call it for survivors of sexual assault, but it's only the man who gets to do that, and her fellow women would all have done the same thing. They just condemn her for failing, and that's absolutely fucked up. And he rubs that in again and again and again. It's like. <sighs> It's it's morally wrong and it, it 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 annoys the fuck out of me. So yeah, I think we're done for today. Not much happened so far. It's still burning hot and we still have the threat for the weather thing, but luckily our girl gang plus Matt is still on it somewhere in Ebudar, and maybe I'll find out about what how they are getting on with that shit by tomorrow. Uh, but the pace has slowed down even more, so I assume at the end of the book we'll still hang around in Kyrian and nothing much will have happened. We'll see by the end of the week. Um, until then, thanks for watching. If you're still with me, thanks for bearing with me. And um, yeah, like, subscribe, do all those wonderful things. Please, I need it. I want it. Anyway, see you around. Cheers. <laughs>